Hello and welcome along to the RT Rugby Podcast. We hope you had a great Christmas. It is me and Bernard Chapman joining you for this week's pod. Birch, how was how was your own Christmas? Yeah, really good. Um, really quiet and uh, yeah, nice time. And then obviously down in, in Tolman Park on uh, on Stephen's Day for the big the pro. So no, enjoyed it. Did you manage to get a, a day off or two at least from one of your your five hundred jobs? Yeah, no, I've had a couple of days off when racing yesterday in Leperstown, which is lovely. Um and I'm going to watch the racing on TV today and then obviously I think Premiership's back on tomorrow. I think Bristol are playing and yeah, get back into rugby then New Year's Day down to Galway for Connacht uh, Ulster and back get back into the New Year. Yeah, exactly. It's coming around thick and fast. We'll get straight into the rugby though, because we've two interpros to look back on, two to look ahead at. But we will start with uh, a bit of news before we get into the games. This cropped up last Thursday. Uh, a day after we did our last podcast of, of the week last week. But obviously the big news that the IRFU have swiftly moved on from Mike Cat. They've got their business done nice and early. Andrew Goodman is going to be moving from Leinster into the Irish setup to work as basically as attack coach, attack and backs coach under Andy Farrell. Um, on the face of it, Birch, anyway, it seems like an appointment that ticks plenty of boxes and generally makes sense across the board. Yeah, I think it does. I mean, I suppose they're probably the most to establish attack coaches in, in Irish rugby at the moment. Probably Mike Prendergast and, and Andrew Goodman. And um uh Goodman obviously has been working with the majority of that Irish backline. Um in fairness, since he came into Leinster, even though he had a smaller role to start, because Stuart Lancaster obviously was looking after both um uh, attack and defence and he was only really looking after first phase strikes um, the feedback from the players was that he was a really good addition and had helped um, help the players they they enjoyed working with him and um, so good feedback from that and now obviously this year he's he's had a bigger role um, he's looking after attack in general and, and um, he has also that international experience of having been at a World Cup so uh, he was at a World Cup with Samoa so yeah I think it's a smart decision in fairness Farrell would get would know him pretty well as well. Obviously, there's good relationship between the provinces and um uh, uh the national squad and yeah, I think everything makes um makes sense. So hopefully it's a it's a good good recruit for Ireland. If you're Leo Cullen, there has to be a bit of frustration there as well. And it's a it's it's a problem of their own making, obviously, because you know, they they would have lost Stuart Lancaster last year, they would have lost Felipe Contopomi the year before, and Dennis Leamy as well. Uh now they've clearly recruited well in each time because they've got Andrew Goodman in, they got Sean O'Brien in, now they've got Jack Nienaber in, but um, it's, as I said, like a problem of their own making where, and I suppose for most clubs as well, where the better you do, people are going to, to want to tap into your people and you're just going to have to keep replacing and replacing. Yeah, that's it. But I also think it may be, may have been good timing from an extra point of view in that, Nina Barr may want um an attack coach that he's familiar with, um, has worked with before, has a similar philosophy. I think that's going to be the the hard part. And you can even see well, well sorry, there's certainly signs that Leinster are playing um a different brand of rugby now. Having said that, how much of that's down to the really bad weather in, in Toma Park and the really bad weather in La Rochelle, which are probably, you know, the two Big game since he came. Sale Sharks obviously was was another one. The weather wasn't too bad, but Sale weren't full strength. And um, I think Leinster have been very pragmatic, very conservative, um, and shown kind of this willingness to play the percentages more than they than they did uh, previously. So whether that's something that Nina Barr uh, um, has had an influence on, and is that the way Leinster are going to go in the future? And then if it is. You know, you probably don't need um an attack coach with the level of of experience or, or of government, or you need someone who's more aligned. You know what I mean? So, or not even you don't even need anybody, but it's probably something that would be nice for Nina Bar to have a coach that is part of his um is his choosing as well. Whereas he's come in now to Leinster and everyone around him is is already there. If you know what I mean? So, I don't think it's it's an overall a bad thing. Um, and if they get someone good, which Leinster have always shown the ability to do. Um, it'll give those players, you know, a, a new voice, uh, a new way of looking at things, and um, can be good for for Leinster and Ireland. 
Yeah, it doesn't look like we'll get an answer anytime soon on it anyway. We we asked Leo Cullen after the, the game at Tone Park the other night and he said it's it's very much the early stages at this stage where they're really just kind of getting an idea of, of what sort of a person they want. Um I would be curious yeah. oh, do you know who want? actually um yeah. sorry, I lost you there for a second, Leo. I, I think um I think someone I should look at is Connor McPhillips, mm-hmm. um who's um who's very very good attack coach um obviously went to school in, in um in temple oak played for mary's played for connaught uh became a coach in connaught um and was a is was with bristol uh he's doing some consultancy work now with, with a couple of teams um and uh i think he's going to be back coaching international rugby soon from what i understand so but he's someone who's a very very good attack coach and any the connor team that won the U.S. or the uh pro 14 um, Bristol Bears, you know, their some other attack was as intricate as any attack around won a challenge cup with with Bristol. So he may be someone that come comes on the radar. I think Leinster have known about this for a little while. Um and again, there's no panic, you know. Um it's a buyer's market for players and or for co- clubs in terms of coaches and players at the moment, which you know, with so much um I suppose change in the game and, and uh a lack of stability in certain clubs, etc. So Leinster will, will be able to recruit someone really, really good. But I think Conor Phillips is someone that certainly, if I was doing a shortlist today, he'd be on it. Would, uh, would anyone with the surname Sexton be on that shortlist? Either, either oh, Mark, he, he would be on the shortlist if you want to be on it. Um, look, look, I don't, uh, 100% he'd be on the shortlist. Uh, I think um, absolutely, if you're looking for someone who, they're different, as in Conor obviously has proven himself as a coach, but there's no doubt that Johnny has um, all the signs of being capable of becoming a, a phenomenal coach, uh, and I suppose there will, there will be a natural break in that. You know, it, it, he's been, he'll have been away from the from the from the building for goods of goods of a year then, because obviously he's been with Ireland camp all summer and and the World Cup. So I don't know. I don't know if it's what he, what he wants to do. Um, if he wanted to do it, I'm sure he'd have he'd have first choice at it, to be honest. But uh, I don't know if he wants. I think he's going into business and um and working for that last, but. Um, certainly he would be on any shortlist if he wanted to be honest. Would Mark Sexton be honest? Yeah, Mark could be honest as well, but um, I don't. Uh, it might be a little early for him. He he seems to be enjoying um the challenge down in 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 Connacht. Look, I think Denster, in fairness, will do a a worldwide search. But I, as I said, I wouldn't be surprised if it comes back to to um someone like someone like Mike Phillips. Um, or certainly uh, certainly he should be. Should be there, thereabouts. Um, and then I don't know if you'd want to take someone from the other provinces. Like, uh, um, imagine Prendergast went to the Munster yeah, after the <laughs> after the row, we saw with Simon. Uh, I might, I might I actually, it, I might actually edit that out. Just to, no, 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 I'm joking. I'm joking. No, I'm just saying, like, you don't, you don't. I don't think you necessarily want to rob from the other provinces. Um, uh, but no, I, I, um, they'll get someone good. The guy used to be mm-hmm. has has proven himself to be pretty. Pretty astute and getting the Stewart, you know, getting um, getting Nina Bar, um, were both you know both left field choices. Not Jack Nina Bar is obviously an standing coach, um, but I don't think any of us saw that coming that they'd be able to get him to come and and go back to a provincial job. Obviously, I haven't won a World Cup, so they're well capable of of getting the right man uh, when, when they need to. Yeah, and I suppose it just to to wrap it up, like it does pretty much sum up the Jack Nina Bar situation that. Guy Easterby and whoever else is going to be tasked with finding this coach, they don't have to wait for CVs to land on the desk. They can go out no. and start bringing around for the person they want rather than see who's coming at them. Look, it's probably the, the most attractive coaching job in, in in the world at club level because of the quality player you have, the facilities you have, um, the depth you have, the pathway, everything. You know, um, it's, it's it, like... That Leinster squad and any of the coaches who get to coach in it um, are, are incredibly lucky, you know, incredibly lucky. And even we saw that in, in the Munster game, which we're going to talk about. I mean, the depth, you know, Munster have an injury crisis, um, which gets worse during the game. And, you know, Leinster have, you know, so much riches. They have a, they have an injury crisis at nine, you know, but they still have, you know, Luke McGrath, an international who can, um, who can play, you know, uh, play in and obviously, Bringing out the likes of Ryan Baird, Jason Jenkins, Dan Sheen, etc. It's uh, it's incredible. 
Yeah, let's talk about that game then. Tone Parks and Stevens Day, Leinster nine, Munster three. Um, like no tries, twelve points in total. Sideways rain. the The wind was blowing diagonal and across diagonal across the pitch, so it wasn't even particularly helping either team in the first or second half. Um, scrums that never seemed to stay up. There was a penalty given at nearly every single one of them. Lineouts going askew on both sides. Having said all of that, I I thoroughly enjoyed it. To be totally honest. And that was the yeah, it was. instance of, of I, you know, I was there, I was in a working capacity, pretty much all of us journalists were chatting together after the match. And the general consensus was as much of a a complete mess as it was out on the pitch, there was something very, very absorbing and engrossing about it. Yeah, look, I, I think it shows you, you can have a low scoring game that, that catches your imagination and catches your interest. Um, I thought, I thought Munster... Did incredibly well to keep Leinster trialist. Um, in fairness, not many teams do that. And, you know, their line at Maldi, even though it was only really two big malls that they had to defend um in that first half, they they stopped Leinster, which is, you know, a massive for them because I think back to a couple weeks ago when they conceded five against Glasgow, mm-hmm. Bayon got a, a the key try from effectively a mall, it ends up being a, they break out and, and and score. But it was from a mall that was going forward uh ten or twelve meters. Um and Leinster's mall is very good when they stopped that and then you know when Leinster went in the second half and they got field position and they got into that pick and go game Munster muscled up and, and that was with, with fellas who who aren't in any way at the same level in terms of you know potential or international experience so I think from Dennis Leamy's point of view that was a real positive positive. Um, and I know people would say well you know the conditions made it easier to defend it did but we saw against Sale Sharks when Leinster bring that power game which they did in the second half. Not many teams can can live with them. Um, so that was a positive. Uh, but Leinster, again, you always felt they were kind of going to win the game. I, I, that, and like, so they look really comfortable in these tight games now, kind of like they did against La Rochelle. Um, and also, to be fair, against Sale, they didn't really panic in the first half when things went against them. Just, you know, they took their opportunity. So, um, yeah, I, the, the counter-argument that I'd like to point out is I'm a bit worried about some of the form of some of the, the Irish players, the World Cup players, like there's you know, um a lot of Marin's really firing um as well as you you would like at the moment and, and hopefully that's a little bit of a blip and in January to start to pick up. Um uh obviously Ty Furlong w- was unavailable and uh, the past of his dad but um you I mean he, he's had a couple of niggles. Porters have to play a lot of minutes um and the more he plays the more you wonder about his scrummaging a little bit um even though it could be obviously very destructive. Um. Yeah, Ty Byrne. I I think I was really annoyed and disappointed to see Munster not being allowed to play Tiger Connor. Um, particularly Connor because okay, Connor has been involved in five matchday squads, but he's only played one hundred and forty-one minutes. And um, you know, I I just think even though we had two strong teams, I think that fixture has to be from in the future. That's one of the things David Humphries has to do is is to allow both coaches go. Absolutely full metal jack in that. And if they have to rest players either side of it, well then they, they do that. But you know, I just think if Munster had had Tyke Burn there, um potentially could have won the game. You know, they he actually could have made that much difference when you look at how close it was and when you think back to the kick into the court or the kicking into twenty two a couple of times and effectively they only really had one other option, which was Tom Ahern and, and then still were able to 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 mark it out pretty easily. Um so uh, that's something I'd love to see Humphreys do. It seems to be very black and white. Connor has been involved in five matchday squads. He has to be arrested for this game. When the reality was he had one start. You know what I mean? I actually think Connor would benefit from playing a little bit now to find a bit of form, you know? Um, so that's like, we can't have data analysts um, basically deciding who plays what matches. You know, there has to be more yeah. communication there. And I think, you know, I think Munster, there's lots of Munster people go mad about RG Snyman. I think, an easier argument is or an e- or a more valid argument is is that decision, you know, that decision on its own. Um uh but anyway, look at there's obviously gonna be a change at the top and and um I'd like to see Humphreys give the commander or the coaches a little bit more flexibility on on, on that. Because they, they need to mind those players as well. I mean, they're not gonna abuse them um by overplaying them. Um but certainly for me, Stevens Day, Leinster Munster sold out. You're 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 robbing the fans of uh, um, of value for money by by holding a couple of players back, I think. 
Yeah, and I think I think Murray is a really good example, actually, of that. Where, as you said, it's the when you actually look at the minutes themselves, yeah. it's not it's not an enormous amount of game time. And I think as well, if you look at the players specifically, um, after having come on and had a frustrating day the previous week against Exeter, I would I would guess the best thing for Conor Murray could have been to go out there against Leinster and get a get a decent afternoon or or, or decent evening under him. To, to kind of put that behind him rather than having to, to stew on it a little while. Similarly as well, Leinster have the the luxury, I suppose, of while they had to rotate, while they had to rest a lot of internationals at the weekend, the internationals who probably played against Munster can rest up against against Ulster this week. And yeah. it, in large part, they don't actually have to worry about the six-day turnaround because a lot of their players coming in are going to have been well-rested after the weekend. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's, that's obviously the... So like Munster losing two... Hurts them way more than Leinster losing four because of just the, the depth of squad. And also, to be honest, like I also am taking into account, particularly in the second row, like the injury crisis that's, that Munster have. I mean, having, you know, RG, Jean Klein, um, et cetera, out. I mean, they had to play Gavin Coombs in, in, in the second row. And then they lost to the Dogbo. It's just, if you're Graham, if you're Graham Rantry, I just think. I think you're looking. You you understand you've got an injury crisis, and then you see the the main stakeholder hurting you as well, or, or holding you back a little bit. I just, just uh, I I don't think it's 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 not ideal to be honest. It's not ideal. But look at um as I said, there's I think that these these are things that that can be changed and and should be changed, particularly for for the big Irish into pros. I I just think we 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 should be seeing the best of the best play each other. On the on the game itself and how how Leinster closed it out, I think that was one of the most the the impressive parts of the Leinster display where, um, Munster had I think you mentioned that chance they had it was around sixty eight minutes. Gavin Coombs wins the penalty. They go down to the corner. Leinster win that line out, and that was pretty much the last sniff of a chance Munster got. Yeah. Pretty much the last ten minutes of that game, Leinster had the ball and they had it in Munster's half of the pitch. They end up changing their props. Porter and Al Toa in fairness, them going seventy plus minutes. But you've Tom Clarkson and Ed Byrne coming on. They win a couple of scrum penalties. They milk the clock down, and eventually they can just tap over three points to to see out the game. For a game that was so tight, for for a game that was so low scoring and back and forth over those eighty minutes, the most the most uninteresting part of it, which Le- Leinster will be delighted by, was probably the last ten minutes of the game. Mm, yeah, that was brilliant by them and. Look, the biggest problem for Munster in the game was their inability to control field position. Like Leinster dominated the territory um, battle, and and I think that's the next step for Munster is to is to basically refine their kicking game, um, because they just couldn't find enough grass. They made some kick errors, um, and they found themselves playing way too much in their own half. And and once Leinster got that penalty from or got that turnover from the line, as you said, sixty eight minutes, just it, Munster got caught trying to play out of their own half with a little possession they had and Leinster just looked so comfortable and um, that's the next layer for them I've said it on the pod a couple of weeks ago like they don't really have a plan B or plan C and I understand why that plan B from an attacking point of view mightn't be you know um, ball in hand play more direct uh, because you could say they don't have the cattle but they do need to have, basically have that uh, kicking game that probably under Van Gran was a core part of it, right? And I would have been critical of it being too much. Or they only had one plan A, which was basically kick. Um, but now they need to get more balance to it. In, in certain days and occasions where you're up against a team who who are well organized in defense, um, were very aggressive. Uh, the conditions manager couldn't get around them that easily. Like against Exeter, they got lots of joy by staying deep and, and just getting that ball to wit. But they couldn't just do it against Leinster for for different reasons. So, um, yeah, that, and that that'll come. But like again, also, I feel sorry for the coaches in that they're trying to patch together a team. You know, they're on a bit of a downer from obviously three games in a row not winning. Um, it's a home game in the in the Tone Park. You want to go out and play. You want to you want to go after Leinster. Um, and in fairness, like you know, the last two games against Leinster, they have been a successful ball in hand. So. I, I can see the logic to it, but just that's the next step is to be better at the contestable kicks, being able to get the ball back, being able to find grass, you know, use Zebo's left foot 
um, a little bit more, have a two sided kicking option. They're the little things that they know about. They just um, they're probably going to have to start to to build into their into their DNA as well because um, uh, when you cope against uh, one of the better teams in Europe and they shut you down, particularly in, in heavy weather, heavy bad, bad con- weather conditions, you, you can't just be a one trick pony. Without without being too Monday morning quarter about a uh, quarterback about it and you know benefits of hindsight and all that. When they did kick that penalty to the corner with about twelve minutes to go, I looked back on this morning. It was about forty-five mm-hmm. meters out. Um, Gavin Coombs had won the penalty. At the time, at the time, I did think, God, I'd be take going for the three points yeah. here. I I know it was a a really really difficult win and conditions were brutal, but at the same time, a line out is is not easily won in those conditions either. Where you have a greasy ball, you're dealing with a massive wind. You have players who are head to toe, soaked wet, caked in mud, where even lifting even lifting in a line out, you know, a hand can slip up out of a leg somewhere. It's not an easy one ball at the line out. I did think at the time, God, I would be fancying my chances of of making this a, a level ball game and see where you go in the last ten minutes. Yeah, so did I. I know they missed the they missed the kick for mm. for post. And it was a big discussion between Crowley and Jack O'Donoghue, I think, over a previous one around whether to go to the corner or post, and eventually O'Donoghue said post. Um, also, they missed touch from, Jack missed touch from a penalty as well, yeah. uh, which kind of let Leinster off the hook a little bit. Now, look, at it, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was very difficult. I, I, I genuinely felt, and it's not one of the more, at the time, we, we were up in the, in the Prez area, and we were saying, take points, take points, because I felt it was going to be, a six all type game, you know, um, and yeah, it was look, it's one of those decisions, but particularly the way their their pack, you know, the coin had gone off, a dog ball had gone off, um, I don't know, I, I think maybe there was a bit of emotion in that, thinking, oh, we're at home here, we kick to the corner, the crowd go, you know, the crowd get going, we build pressure, but yeah, I, 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 I um, I, I'd be taking shots of goal now. I think shots of goal are. Are coming back in fashion, um, and some teams have have kind of got onto that a little bit quicker than than others. Two of the two of the people we were talking about after the game were were two young second rows who had contrasting nights. Edwin Adogbo, um, just with that awful looking injury, it's Graham Rowntree says it's probably going to be an Achilles. Um, we know he's had issues with similar injuries before. Um, and it was just t- tough to see a player who's been in such great form, a young player as well, go down like that. But on the flip side, Joe McCarthy, who was player of the match on the night and someone who who seems to have taken the news of Orgy Snyman's signing a little bit personally and has, um, seems seems a little bit riled up by it. He was outstanding. Yeah, he's, he's, he's getting better every game he plays. And obviously, conditions suited him. Uh, and the way Leinster defensively now are are looking to get off the line. Look, not just get off the line, that sounds it's very generic, but the, the blast and the defensive rooks. So that's set like a, like a virus trying to infect the rook and, and just make it messy and bring people in, slow it down. And someone like McCarthy who has a natural size and aggression is really, really good at it. And, and um we we know he moves really well. So when he gets a chance to take a pick and go or or, or carry um, you know, he's he's difficult to take down, but he has this natural bit of bite about him. And um, like we haven't, you know, it's amazing. We've got two similar type profile locks in the dog bone him, um, in terms of big physical tight head locks. And we haven't had we haven't had that profile really. If you think about it, like we've imported him. We've imported John Klein, Quinn Rue, um to try and get that uh get that type of, of of player. Jason Jenkins is, is is a similar type. And in fairness, it's Joe has got past Jason Jenkins and looks better. And just Jason Jenkins is a, is a is a springbok, you know. Um so there's, there's there's valid reasons why everyone's so excited about him. And yeah, I, I, he was obviously player of the game or man of the match and uh I thought he was excellent. He's a very like a very messy player where it was like yeah. it seemed like every single rock he was he was in there and he was wrestling with someone and just he wasn't actually winning turnovers or anything, but he was just annoying people and slowing down ball. And sometimes that's that's all you have to do, really, isn't it? Yeah, and I, I look at it, it's it, the Leinster aren't the only team who are doing this, but they're doing it probably as well as as anybody. Um, it's to put massive focus on that plus one. So 
the 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 primary tackler is, is is taking legs and the second tackler is going high. But once he's finished that tackle, or if he's a slightly late, his job then is to get in there and make it an absolute mess. And like, I feel sorry for nines at the moment because um, there's bodies everywhere. There's legs. There's people coming back on top of them. Um, and it's just teams are willing to concede a man in their defensive line to slow that ball down and, and, and make over. And Leinster, Leinster are really buying into that. And, and I'd say there wasn't, there was probably only about 10% of Munster's rooks the other night, which were probably clean and, 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 and quality, you know, uh, quality ball under four seconds. So they're doing a great job of that. And that's allowing them to be, get set, but it's also allowing them to be set narrower as well because they, they're, they're able to get off the line to the next phase and, and, and go on and, and win that space. So, um, but yeah, someone like him who obviously has that natural, he kind of seems to have freakish strength, really. He's kind of like, you remember Tony Buckley? He was really yeah. good at it uh, back in the day. I was a blast in the past, but Buckley was very good at that as well. Just his sheer size, um, he was able to really affect that that attacking rook. Yeah, and it seems like it's, it's one of those players that on another day, he might well concede four penalties. Yeah. But, no, look, I, and, and, that yeah. is, and that is the risk and you're towing a bit of a line there but ultimately over the course of a season the positives will more than likely outweigh the negatives yeah I think at the moment that's the next step for refereeing uh, because look think about it right so the the, the lawmakers the, the TV companies etc they want high ball and play time right and and the ball and play is technically in play in that situation yeah. but it's actually making it very hard to attack right so um, but up till now the focus has been on the the tackler not rolling away, so the primary tackler, you know, going east or west, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The jackaler, the referees don't really like jackal. Uh, sorry, referees are focused on the jackal threat, whereas what McCarthy's trying to do, or any of the other Leinster plus ones or Munster as well, it's fairness because they're quite similar. Um, but they're they're actually not really interested in the ball. They're just trying to barge and charge and and make it a mess. And like I would say that. If you went through them in a micro in detail, there's probably a lot of times there that there's they're breaking a law somewhere, you know. Um, but because they're not t- jackling, um, and they're not taking unless unless they grab the nine, the refs are kind of letting it go. But it is making the game. It's really good defense. Um, and but it is making the game a little bit harder to play. If you know, to, sorry, sorry, it's making it harder to play attacking rugby. Yeah, like Gra- Graham Roundtree described the the breakdown as a street fight the other night, which yeah, is a, it was mental. A pretty mental, accurate but, way of yeah, saying. Yeah, but we don't <laughs> unless you watch it the second time, as you know, Neil. You you, you don't you don't actually see a lot of stuff that's going on. Yeah. You just you know what I mean. Uh, you see bodies flying left, right, and center, and but uh, that is the next step for referees is how they're going to deal with that 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 counter rooking element of it. We'll move on to, to Ulster and Connacht. Ulster 20, Connacht 19 from Friday night now, if people are losing track of what day it is. Um, the weather not as bad as it was at Thomond Park and St. Stephen's Day, but the wind was absolutely howling there and it did make things really, really difficult. Having said all that, though, a pretty decent pretty decent game all round. Ulster, Birch, good value for it in the end. Um, yeah, it were good value. I don't think they were, to be honest. I thought that game could have could have easily fallen into Connacht's hands. I I think Connacht would be disappointed with um a, an opportunity missed. Mm-hmm. It obviously feel better that they they looked they were more competitive than they were against Bayon or sorry Bordeaux or or, or Saracens. Um, I don't think Connacht played brilliantly either. Um, but they were there and they were there in in the, in the shakeup for the last ten minutes and and Ulster closed it out. Um. Ulster both wingers would be absolutely gutted with two defensive errors. I mean, Balakloons, Balakloons on on Purdy Langton, you can't miss there. He's got you know, um, I know it's a great finish and he's strong, but can't miss there. And then Stockdale made a he didn't miss a tackle. He's made a really bad defensive read, um, and cost him the 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 the, the next try. Um, yeah, I, I thought Ulster just lost an opportunity to. To build on racing, and now I like they won, so it's back to back wins at home. But um, I yeah, I'm 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 not convinced that they're they're contenders. You know, I think once they get back those players from injury, I, I I'd be confident enough that they'll build and find find a more form quickly. Um, and Ulster may, but I don't know. What do you think? Uh, you were like 
you're obviously yeah, more well, opposition no, like when I, I probably said it, when I said good value I probably just meant they over the course of the 80 minutes I thought they probably deserved it um in fairness then though I will say Johnny Bell and Ian Henderson speaking after the game the main message was yeah we're you know we're happy and all we have the points good derby win before Christmas but um they probably were talking about more negatives than positives and we're talking about more things that they should be getting better on. For example, as you mentioned, those two tries, the the Seamus Hurley Langton one and the uh Shane Bolton one, where they had got themselves into pretty commanding positions mm. on two occasions there. It was 17-7 and it was 2012 before both those tries. And you know, on each occasion, when you're at home in the second half and you've got a bit of daylight between yourself and and Connacht in an interpro to let them back in twice was probably a was something they'll be really really frustrated on similarly as well the like I, I just thought on the Seamus Hurley Langton try I know you mentioned it as well but a good finish fair play to him yeah. um to score from out there but two one-on-one tackles from Balakoon and Will Addison as well and they just fell off him in fairness James Hume nearly caught him in the end but Hume shouldn't have been in a situation where he had to catch him that sort of stuff is, I suppose, as a coach, is probably going to have you ripping your hair out. Yeah, and I, I've, I've said this before. Like, I, that's the, I think, Ulster, they can see too easily. Like, and that's regular okay, against Racing. Even someone tries, even some of their line breaks, like Garrick made against against them, was like ridiculously soft. And he's a brilliant player. Um, and and again, those two tries, like, you have no right to be talking about winning silverware. And at first, they they would argue they're not talking about it, but um, I I think that like Ulster have to be a team who are talking about winning silverware, you know, um, at some stage, and, and the rebuild is is kind of maturing now, um, and that's and and that's not down to look at that the both those I don't think that's down to Jonathan Bell's defensive system. I mean, um, yeah, you can't account for the no, no, you can't account for that, like. Yeah, people could say, "Oh, he needs to be doing tackle technique, training, and all that stuff." But realistically, they are. That's just literally. Do I am I hundred percent committed to stopping um this man in this situation? That that the Hurley Langton one, the other one, the other one. I just think it's a it, they get very narrow. And it's a really bad read by by Stockdale. But um again, that's not a once off. That's that happens a lot to them. That happened against Lions. That happened against Edinburgh when they lost at home. Um and. That happened against Connacht in the sports ground when they were what twenty points to three up at at half time or something like that, and they allowed Connacht back into into the game. So, um, yeah, that's the, that's the issue for them, and and uh, until they fix that, um, you know, they're they're going to be very mixed in terms of the results. And um, yeah, it's a win, it's a win, um, and it's important in terms of the table, uh, and it puts Connacht under massive pressure this beginning. It's Munster now to get a win, but. I just don't think they they missed a massive opportunity to build in that feel good factor of what was a really good performance against Racing and um I think a lot of the Ulster fans leaving the sports ground and Ulster players leaving the sports ground would have felt a little bit I suppose um underwhelmed going into Christmas, particularly as well maybe after the the start they had to the game where they came out they they hit the ground running they got their they got their early try from from Andy Warwick and they looked really really sharp in that early stage and. Just a few minutes later, then Connor to go up and score. And while Ulster, they managed their way to the win in the end, they didn't necessarily produce anything spectacular along the way. No, that was it. And um, like they did, I thought the first phase of the, the first opening block of attack was brilliant. And I was like, wow, that's that Racing win has just given them that confidence to go and play. Um, they got they got a reward from it as well, which is, you know, um, which is ideal. And then as soon as Connor got up the other end, you just felt there was no real intensity about their their goal line D. I thought it was quite a soft try that they conceded, you know, in the end, really. Um, for early in the game, fatigue shouldn't have been an issue, and that and that was kind of the story of it. They just gave up, they gave up those little yards too easily, you know, at, in areas of the field that you, you just can't. From the the Connacht point of view, the the biggest frustration afterwards when we were talking to Pete Wilkins was just compounding errors with more errors. And particularly, he highlighted at the start of the second half, the first three or four minutes of it, they came out flying. They were right on top of those first few minutes. They win a penalty in midfield. Jack Carty sticks it down into the corner with the wind behind their back. And you're thinking, okay, this is a great opportunity now to come out flying start of the second half. They lose the line out. 
A minute later, they give up a penalty for crossing. Ulster go down the pitch and Connacht give up two more penalties along the way. And all of a sudden, after Connacht had made a blistering start of the second half, John Cooney is tapping over a penalty to make it 17 points to seven. And from there, Connacht are kind of chasing the game. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, similar, and similarly, actually, as well, after Connacht get their Seamus Hurley Langton try to get it back to 17 points to 12, what do they do? Concede a penalty. John Cooney puts it over the puts it over the post to make it a, a two score game again. Yeah, and and that's going to be the worry for Wilkins is is that's not as easy fix as you know designing a a, a three phase strike play. You know, uh, they they uh, are getting an attacking philosophy in place. It's that that ment- mental weakness you would certainly say that they've shown uh, shown at times over the last couple of years. Um. And it just makes it so hard for them to win games. Because I genuinely felt that that game was was there was there for them, and it would have been a huge win for them to to beat Ulster and Raven Hill. I, I I think if Connacht had have been a little bit cleaner in some of those areas, um, Ulster were were certainly there for for the taking, and and that would frustrate Wilkins because he would have seen that as being a um a, an opportunity lost, and on the back of two two heavy defeats, really. Would you give them a decent chance on Monday against Munster, where? Connacht had the benefit of a 10-day turnaround in comparison to Munster's six. Not really sure what the, the squad update is at this stage. We'll find out later today. But, I mean, if Connacht can get Mac Hansen, Bundyaki out onto the pitch, um, Finley Bealham as well, if they can get close to a full team, Munster then, with the injuries they've had, a shorter turnaround as well leading up into this game. How much of a, a chance would you give Connacht at home? Yeah, to be honest, Mike, thinking, uh, I, I was thinking about that this morning. I thought Munster would go and win there. Uh, I, I think. Do you still think? Yeah, I'm not. I do. I, 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 I'm not sure. I'm not massively sure where Connacht are at. And I was positive about the Mary Doors, and I know they got out of blocks quickly, but there's just been little creaks in their game. Um, and I'm going back. Like, I don't think they're in great form. I, I even go back to the Leinster game. That wasn't that was a very average Leinster team on paper compared to what they could put what they put out against Munster, what they could put out. And it was just set up for Connor to go and beat them. And you know, just that even at the last defensive block where you know, and how they were obviously which leads to Frawley's try. I just thought there was there was too many soft elements of it. And I think Munster, if the conditions if the conditions are okay, I think Munster's attack um their plan A, whatever, uh, will will rip Connacht apart at times, and that's the um, that's why I'm I'm probably tipping Munster at the moment. Now, obviously, we got to see the team, um, but I presume Tyburn will come back in, Connor will come back into the squad. I don't know if they have to rest Crowley now, do they? I, I'm not sure. How, um, I'm not sure what Connacht will go with, but I think her length. Well, Munster will be able to go with obviously injuries uh, to Hooker could be a big um, a big issue for them. But yeah, at the moment, I'm just, I'm just think Connacht's defense isn't isn't where it needs to be. Um, and if they don't shore that up, they they lose and and they're into pro at home. Yeah, and the the tricky thing then as well is where at times against Saracens and Ulster they scored some lovely tries and all yeah. that. And they've picked up bonus points maybe where on other days they mightn't have. They're still now in the habit of losing, which is five games in a row. And I think is it is it six and seven and you know, is is that habit of losing almost the the difference between them sneaking over the line in Belfast the other night and and missing yeah. it by a point? Look, their confidence has to be dented. I mean, the to lose to Leinster, you know, with the game with the game in your hands with two minutes to go, um, and then you know to get hammered by Bordeaux in a big European game on a Friday night in in the sports ground to go to Saracens. Okay, you score some good tries, but you ship fifty. And then to go to Ravenhill and know that they were there for the taking, and yet not manage to to kill them off, um, does put pressure on them for for this weekend, um, this weekend. And look, I I I understand Connor don't have the same budget and squad depth, etc. But um, they'll just be a little bit worried around uh how do you get out of this little little blip at the moment. Final point then to to come back around onto Ulster and their chances against Leinster at the RDS this weekend, um. We spoke about, for example, Connacht having the benefit of the the longer layoff leading up to this in comparison to Munster. 
is it probably not as relevant in this game considering Leinster will have the benefit of probably bringing in a good few players who who had Monday or who had Tuesday night off? Yeah, I, I don't think it is. I think that this is this is a difficult game for Ulster, um, and I actually think Leinster will will actually want to play again, play a little bit more now. They'll, they'll be frustrated that they didn't score a try the weekend, um, and they'll freshen the team up. They'll have had the the feel good factor of a of a good away win. Um, they're obviously unbeaten since round one, which was during the World Cup block. Um, yeah, and they're ticking along nicely. They're loving life under Nina Barr. Um, and yeah, there's there's so much depth there, and they they want a big win going to kick him into Europe. So that's a tough one for Ulster. They also need to be careful that they that they're they're really. I think Ulster need to be really really competitive in this game, you know, and and uh make it difficult for them. So which they've been able to do in the past. They've been able to come to. The RDS with even second string sides and had a have had a really smart kicking game, have had good defense and made it difficult for Leinster. Um, but if they don't come with a bit of grit about them, I think Leinster could look to actually. I think Leinster would be very focused on their defense. I think Leinster could see this game as an opportunity to get their attack back, um, in, in kind of flow. And if they're allowed to do that, it could be a, a, a really, really tough one for, for Ulster. If you're an Ulster fan and and I was to say to you now, give you the opportunity that Ulster put in a a reasonable enough performance and come away with a losing bonus point, would you? Would you? Yeah, yeah, be, I think right. look at any team coming to the RDS, anything coming to the, to the RDS would take that. I think that's just that's just been the reality of the last five or six years. Is that um, that's a good result in, in Dublin? Yeah, Leinster against Ulster in the URC. That's live on RT two and RT player on New Year's Day. Uh, you can hear live commentary as well of Leinster, Ulster and Connacht Munster on RT Radio 1. And we'll have live blogs as well on rt.e forward slash sport and the RT News app. Birch, very last question for you since this is our last podcast of, of 2023. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot now. What was your what was your highlight of the year? Ireland, South Africa. Ireland, South Africa. It's terrible. It's terrible. It's a group match in a World Cup. But... Yeah. I was lucky enough to be there, um, and I just thought it was it, it was phenomenal, you know. And it was a low scoring game as well, but it was just a unique occasion, uh, probably as good as sporting event I've been at for a long time. Um, and I know people say that's ridiculous, but because uh, there wasn't a huge amount of stake in the overall scheme of things, but as an as an occasion, I thought that was um, my highlight of the year. You, I'll I'll go, I'll I'll skip the World Cup. I'll yeah, go, I'll go with something enough, pretty better off, yeah, and. Uh, I might be betraying my roots, but honestly, the first twenty minutes of the Champions Cup final in the Aviva, I I cannot mm. remember ever seeing the Aviva going as nuts as that place was in the first twenty minutes when Leinster scored three tries. Not so much just the celebrations of Leinster being that far ahead from people, but it was the sheer shock of what we were seeing, where it seemed like every time Leinster got the got the ball, not even first twenty minutes, sorry, it was first eleven or twelve minutes, wasn't it, where they scored three tries? Yeah. And every yeah. single time they got the ball, it felt like they were running in to score. Mm. And the entire stadium was just in shock. And I just, I, it was one of those proper pinch me moments to to be at a match. I thought the tunnel at half time was better. But anyway, we, <laughs> we won't go there. We won't go there. We leave that for, for we leave that for next year. We'll, we'll, sa- we'll save that for another podcast. But yeah, look, that's it. From, uh, that's it from uh, 2023 on the RT Rugby podcast. We will be back though next Wednesday for our first pod of 2024. Have a happy new year.